Non, non, c'est bon. Ik ga, ik ga heel snel een, uh, een korte introductie doen. Uh, wie is hier al geweest bij Digitize? So who has been here before? Who has not been here before? Okay, just for you then. <laughs> um, uh, this is um, a, a space for the tech communities of Brussels. Basically what happened is that already nearly six years ago we started with the data science community and uh, uh, based of and we created a meetup and with that meetup that meetup grew very very quickly and we ended up with with thousands and thousands of members and and when we were doing meetups we there were like 200 people at that time because it was the very early days of data science and everybody wanted to know what it was all about then uh, AXA, the AXA group said, why don't you use our office space and we have also tw 12 training rooms. And so what we started to do is invite uh, uh, people who wanted to create their company inside of our, of our, of our co-working space and, and, and we started to use the, the uh, uh, training, uh, rooms. training rooms and, and we would and we make, the make the training rooms training available. Rooms available. make the training rooms available for those who wanted to train uh, for free. So if it was free, then um, we would end up, um, the person giving the training would not have to pay. And if he wanted to get paid for his training, which is also logical, uh, he would leave something behind for the community. That's how we created the data science community and how we started to need a space to work from because a lot of people depended on having that space to start to, uh, to, to do the training or the meetups uh, at one point AXA moved and we, 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 s we went to uh, look for another space and we found that space in uh, here so but this space is four times bigger than what we had at AXA at AXA 600 square meter here is more than 2000 square meter and to make it avail uh, uh, affordable we then included other communities because by then we had the experience how to build a community and 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 and, and we we included the the blockchain community and the iot community and 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 and, and uh, also community of um, uh, 2d 3d animation movies and things like that so all the tech communities of Rotos are welcome here uh, to either come and work create a startup do a meetup create an event or, or run a hackathon of 200 people you know that's why the the, the space has been created so that was in short, uh, I w when we d were doing the meetups at, at AXA, Rick will come with beer, <laughs> two crates of beer. Uh, now that's not needed anymore because we have our own bar. Um, and, uh, but, but, but Rick has been here since the early days and, and uh, we're so pleased to see people coming back uh, and, and, and continue to use uh, the space. So I wish you a very pleasant uh, meetup. I heard the pizza pizzas will be, be be there soon, so uh, so 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 that will be for the break. See you soon. Bye bye. Work. Is it the same thing? Yes, it is. Yeah. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. They one of the beautiful services of the people from Digitizer is that they record the talks and they actually live stream it, and maybe that's why. We only have a couple of people <laughs> here <laughs> because the people are <laughs> sitting at home watching it maybe. But um, that's that's great. Um, so people that don't know me, my name is Rick, uh, Rick van Bruggen. Uh, I've uh, been working for Neo4j for the past seven years and uh, um, have all the scars, and um, and uh, but also all the happiness uh, that came with that. And um, I've been trying to facilitate the... the the meetup uh, in Brussels for a long time. Um, so today um, we're going to talk about two things. We've prepared uh, two presentations uh, together with uh, Anthony and Emmanuel uh, from the Python Predicts Group and Fortpolis Group. Um, uh, but I'm also going to give you a little bit of an update on what's going on in the wonderful world of graphs uh, and what, what, what we are working on and what, um, what, what our kind of like the big trends that we're seeing. Um, so the pizzas are ordered. Uh, they will be here uh, whenever they show up. <laughs> uh, you never know uh, with uh, Domino's Pizza. The but I, rec I would recommend that we don't let them cool down. 
uh, right? So if they arrive, then I will just stop and then we will go and have a, a slice of pizza and if necessary, I can continue after that. Um, that's that's uh, That would be my recommendation. Otherwise you get uh, melted pizzas and that's not very nice. So uh, 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 that's what I, what I would like to do. Um, yeah, and, and so um, we'll, we'll, we'll go through this uh, today. If is everyone familiar with graphs and with graph databases already? I mean, uh, some unfamiliar faces, some familiar faces, obviously, but uh, are you guys familiar with graphs in Neo4j already? Not really? Not really? Okay. Just, uh, okay. I see some nodding, I see some no's, so <laughs> that's always the balancing act that we will have to go through. Um, and uh, yeah, um, I, I say if you have big questions, you know, grab me. Herman is also here, also from Neo4j, and uh, we can we can always have a, a beer conversation or a pizza conversation if you have any questions, right? So, um, so let's, ta let's talk a little bit about uh, about the state of the graph, as we as we call it sometimes. So Neo4j has been uh, has been around for quite some time, right? It's a, it's a graph database, but it's uh, it's gone through quite an evolution. It started out as a as an open source project in two thousand and one, uh, which seems like you know <laughs> an e eternity ago. Um, uh, three guys, guys in, in a, a lonely, lonely garage, garage in Malmo, Malmo Sweden, Sweden, that, that uh, didn't, didn't have a social life, life and decided to, decided to start, start hacking. hacking. Um, uh, and, uh, and, and now we're a company, company, but we're primarily, we're primarily also, also an open source, source community. community. Um, and, 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 and I think that's, 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 that's still, still a very still big part, part of who we are. are. I mean, yes, yes you know, we're a commercial organization and we want to uh, make sure that that, um, that that commercial organization can t stand the test of time. But there's also a lot of stuff going on in the open source world, which is why we do events like this, right? It's, uh, we want to give people also free access to the technology so that they can make a difference in their, uh, in their domain. Um, so, I mean, just to give you some, some stats, we have a community website. You can go to community.neo4j.com. It's actually a really vibrant place to go for not just, you know, information, but also for Q&A for if you have a problem, you can ask things there and people will actually react to it. Uh, it's, uh, it's really good. Um, we, um, as, a, as a company, we primarily do business with uh, larger enterprises but we have a ton of startups using Neo4j, you know, like smaller organizations, and basically we give the we give the software away for free to those people. If you're a, if you're a startup and and you wanna you wanna start going with graphs, w you don't have to pay for us for it uh, uh, at all. Um, we we do a lot of events, you know, community events like this, but also uh, you know sometimes it's uh, it's around uh, uh, right around specific things that happen like for example uh, when was that that was i think april 2019 so about six months ago uh no a little bit more eight months ago we uh we had the 300th birthday of leonard euler i don't know if you know leonard euler but he's the founder of graph theory uh right he, he kind of invented network science um um because he from a mathematical point of view he he kind of started developing a new part of math mathematics uh, around graphs and uh, so we actually celebrated his birthday <laughs> you know and we had like six 60 different events uh, all across the world you know where people were having cake for oil for Euler um, and that's the kind of thing that we do uh, and that's why we have a very a vibrant community and it's still uh, extremely extremely active there's a lot of people um, working with Neo4j. I mean, we're going to learn from one of them uh, later, the Spot Palace. Uh, there's a lot of people that are using it, not just in the large enterprises, but also in, I would say, smaller organizations that, that, that want to get their feet wet with, uh, with graphs, because it's very popular. I mean, uh, graphs, I think, has been a little bit downplayed the past 40 years uh, with, uh, with the the rising of relational databases in the 80s, uh, late 70s, early 80s, it kind of obliterated any other data model. Um, people have been looking at tables uh, until they were blue in the face. And um, it's only recently that people have been starting to go back to 
a data model that is very much older, <laughs> which is literally the, the, the network model, the graph model. Uh, I mean, when I started to work for Neo4j in 2012, I tried to explain it to my dad, right? And, and I was saying, you know, this is what I'm going to do. And he was like, I was doing exactly the same thing on the mainframe in, in the 70s, because, you know, mainframes had Codasil databases, uh, IDMS, IMS, and they were very much based on the graph data model. You know. So it's, it's kind of coming back. Um, it's kind of coming back, but with a vengeance. It's coming back with, uh, with uh, lots of improvements. Um, one of the things that my dad struggled with when he was doing IMS and IDMS development uh, um, is basically that you had to be a COBOL programmer in order to work with those databases. You, you had to be a programmer. There was no query language to, to interact with the database. It's hard to imagine, right? But that's what it was like at the time. And the biggest reason why people migrated to relational databases was SQL. It's a structured query language, right? Um, and that, that's the reason why people have, have been driven to relational databases in the past 30, 40 years. Um, and we're kind of trying to do something about that. Uh, we're kind of we were trying to bring back the advantages of the network data model of, of the, the graph data model combined with declarative querying, which people love in the SQL world. And guess what? There's a new acronym that you're going to have to remember, and that's GQL, <laughs> the graph query language. And it's very similar to if you know Neo4j, you probably know Cipher, right? It's going to be 95% Cypher, but it's going to be an ISO standard. It's going to be something that's uh, that's supported by people like Oracle, by people like IBM, by people like SAP. Um, they're actually on the board of the of the approving committee, and GQL has actually been moved to uh, the next stage in the standardization process. So it's uh, it's it's quite exciting for us, right? So. Um, I guess what we're what we're trying to do with Neo4j is we're trying to bring these ni these uh, graph databases to a much broader uh, audience, right? Um, and um, yeah, I guess you see some of the some of the keywords here, but it's very much something that we try to build bottom up. You know, there's a lot uh, there's a lot of focus on the practitioner on making it easy for. Uh, for people that actually use the software, uh, not just for the business guy that needs to solve a problem, but also for the technical person who is who is uh, in need of a technical solution, um, and that's why we keep doing these events. We do higher level events as well, but <laughs> you know this is is a key part of our focus is to uh, have this pr practitioner led uh, adoption. We want to make it simple. Want to make it easy for people. Um, we want to add value. We want to add. We solve hard, hard problems, um, and we do it in a in a in a nice way. I mean, one of the reasons that I've been working for Neo4j for seven years is because it's just a really nice company. <laughs> it's a it's a really nice place to work uh, because we value relationship. Um, by developers for developers, and always looking for feedback. Um, feedback that we've heard is, is kind of like this. Um, when I started working for Neo4j, you literally had to have a PhD in network theory in order to use the tool. It was really difficult to use, and I, I had lots of issues with it in the early days, and I couldn't get it to work myself. Uh, I, I was always dependent on like these alpha developers to help me out for uh, any kind of questions, and I think that's absolutely no longer the case. You, know, you can do very interesting Productive things with Neo4j without a PhD, without being in a rocket, uh, a rocket scientist, uh, make it a lot more easier. So that's been a journey, right? That's been a, it's been something that we, that we've been evolving over time. Um, we typically release a major release of Neo4j every six months or so, six to nine months, and there's a very large new release coming up in January of this year, of next year. Sorry. <laughs> Of, of next year, uh, and that's Neo4j 4.0. And I've got a couple of slides here. We can go into depth or not uh, about you know what 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 is in that um, in that release, just so that people um, um, have a little bit of an update there. Uh, uh, have you guys used Neo4j already? Are you, are you familiar with the with the with the? Yeah, you haven't yet. Yeah. So, 
Um, yeah, I wonder if I should just give a two-minute demo of of the current version of Neo4j and show you show show something. Um, I'll uh, I'll see if I can do that easily. Um, so when you when you have this is the standard interface for Neo4j, right? This is what we call the Neo4j browser. Looks very similar to you know any kind of database management tool, except for the fact that I, I'm looking at the Domino's screen over here. So <laughs> I have to <laughs> I have to pizzas are on the way actually. <laughs> so <laughs> they have this li real time tracking thing. Um, but what you see, so this database, what I've got here is my, this is going to be my Christmas project. No, I'm going to finish it before Christmas. It's, um, you remember Hillary Quin Clinton's uh, emails? Uh, you know, they were, she got into a lot of trouble uh, for it. It was hacked by the Russians, but it was afterwards it was published um, by the American government because they wanted to see, you know, what have you been up to, right? Have you, have you been doing government stuff on your private email server. So those emails are actually pu in the public domain today. They've been cleansed, right? So they're not, they're not publicly available. But I've imported those into, uh, into Neo4j. So what I've got here, yeah, I, ju I can't see this. This is difficult. Uh, these are emails, right? Uh, I've clicked it twice. But like you see, what you've got here, you don't have any table structures anymore. It just doesn't exist anymore. You can get a table table structure if you write a query in your result set, but at the database level, it's all about uh, um, nodes connected to other nodes with relationships, right? This is the I'm just trying to make the point that this is a very different data model. You structure the data in a very different way, nodes connected to other nodes with relationships. Nodes represent entities, an email, a person, whatever, right? Um, relationships, they basically represent connectivity between those entities, right? Joins between those entities, right? Um, so I'm not sure if you can see this here, but what, uh, what I've done here, uh, this is work in progress, right? So you've got um, emails uh, right at the top left, right? Um, they are sent by people, right? There's about 250 people in there. Um, and so you've got relationships between the emails and the people, right? Because someone sends an email and someone receives an email. Uh, but then you see all those things on the right-hand side. Um, so I've done two things. Sorry. Uh, what I've done here is uh, the people, I've done some graph analytics on it. I don't know if you can see this, but here at the bottom, you will see some um, some uh, scores. No, no, this it's on the person. It's not on the email, right? On the e on the on the people, I've uh, calculated the two scores, page rank, right, and between us, right? Um, why? Because that's going to give me a lot of information about the importance of those people in the network, right? I don't know if you. You see my gray gray hair, and you I, you know that I remember web search before Google, before PageRank, and how shitty it was, right? And uh, that's the same thing here. PageRank is going to give you information about which parts of the network are more impo important. I don't have to read a single email. I don't have to look at anything. I just run the algorithm, and it tells me which parts of the network are more connected and which parts of the network are going to be more interesting. Same thing with betweenness. Betweenness is the characteristic of if I have uh, parts of the graph, right, they're always, there's, always, there's always some connectivity between those two parts, right? There's a path that runs from one thing to another thing. That path passes through other things, right? How frequently you pass through that other thing determines how between it is. How between is it between other things? If every time there's a path that goes through something, it says something about how it 
forms a bottleneck or doesn't form a bottleneck bet on information flow between different parts of the network. So it's actually a really interesting indicator, not on, on, on importance, but on influence, right? Because if the between people go away, the, the parts of the network, they drift apart. There's a in really interesting study that was done on cell phone networks in Belgium, uh, on call data in Belgium, and how the people that are in Brussels, right, are extremely between Flam Fla Flemish people and Walloon people, right? Because guess what? They speak, speak both languages, <laughs> right? So you can, betweenness is a really interesting characteristic as well. So, and that's, that's giving me that's giving me information without reading a single email about the structure of the network, right? And then you see all these other things over there. Uh, I don't want to go into too much detail there, is but I've run some some uh, natural language processing on the emails, uh, right? So where you ex extract email uh, keywords, right? So first you do annotations. There's annotated texts at the top there. And then there's name, enter name entity recognitions, right? So you recognize organizations, people, uh, percentages, locations, money, you know, all those types of entities. And then based on those name entity pairs, you, you create keywords you, or key phrases. And so then you can see, okay, what's, what is this about? What is this corpus about? And, and uh, you know, I don't want to go into too much detail, but you will see that there's like half the emails are about Benghazi, right? Which, which was the attack on the American embassy in Libya uh, that killed a bunch of uh, American officials, and they had been warned about that. And Clinton basically got almost got fired for that in the in the Obama uh, administration. So this is kind of what Neo4j does. <laughs> it's a very <laughs> strange example maybe, but there's a lot of simpler examples as well. But it's a really interesting one. Um, and it gives you a little bit of, of a feel for what you can do with it, right? You can, you can, you can do all kinds of different things with it, but uh, essentially just by looking at the data in a different way, by structuring the data in a different way, you're immediately going to get some kind of new insights. You're going to see, you know, what's important, what's not sim not important. What are things? What what are this? What are um, the 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 bottlenecks potentially in the structure? And you just don't see that if you're looking at table structures. It's impossible, right? The rest will keep for the pizza time. Is that okay? <laughs> um, and then I'll just go back to the presentation here, just to give you a little bit of a feel of what's coming um, in the wonderful world of graphs in the upcoming months. Um, there's a lot of interesting things that are coming, but you know, if obviously you, you want to start with the, ba the basics. Um, in, the, in the software development world, there's a lot of talk about reactivity, about reactive uh, software development which basically means that you want to have some kind of a stronger um, uh, but asynchronous link between what the client sees in the front end, you know, what, what the end user sees and what's happening in the background, background right? Um, so, so essentially that means that the client application has a lot more control over what's happening in the back, back end and that requires the database to behave in a very different way specifically the the synchronous and asynchronous execution methods are very important normally if you have synchronous uh, execution that means that the client is basically saying okay i'm asking you a question and i'll wait here <laughs> until i hear back from you right but in an asynchronous way you know you just fire the question and you go away and you get you get notified when the answer uh, is ready for you which is a very different way of, of developing applications. And there's a lot of implications uh, that, uh, that that has, but Neo4j, sorry, I'm jumping around here, but the, uh, the short of it is that Neo4j 4.0 is going to have a lot more support for that type of software development, which is important for software developers, right? For practitioners that are, uh, that are making new applications. 
it basically means that the APIs that you use to talk to the database are, are, are they're not replaced, they're getting new functionality, right? They're getting a lot, a lot of new functionality, um, which is going to be interesting for new applications. Um, Multi-database is another big thing in, in, uh, in um, Neo-J, Neo-J 4.0. May seem trivial for people that coming coming at this from a from a SQL Server or a relational database background. In the relational world, it's very common to have one database server run multiple databases, right? Uh, that was never the case with Neo4j. Every Neo4j server had one and only one database, right? Which is kind of sucky, right? But it's been that way for a long time, um, and it, it was perfectly workable, right? And you could get a lot of things done with it, but in the new version, you will actually see that you can run multiple databases on the same server, which makes it a lot easier to to prototype, to host uh, stuff, uh, multiple things on one server, to, to do rap to rapid testing, rapid developing, to make it a lot more cloud-friendly as well, you know, with uh, uh, different uh, multi-tenancy uh, solutions and those types of things, right? So going from one server hosting one database to one server hosting multiple databases and um, you will see that in the UI and you will see that in the in the um, in the um, the way you interact with it you basically have to specify which database you want to use in every query obviously not in every query in every session right so that's a little bit of a change for for users this one is going to look very very um complicated um, and, and that's because it is uh, <laughs> complicated pizzas that's a pizza I'm going to take that because that's probably the pizza okay hello oui oui je vais on va ouvrir la porte uh, juste une minute s'il vous plaît merci il y a une livre d'eau je suis avec toi Sorry about that. I'll just very quickly finish this topic and then we, we can uh, have our pizzas. Uh, what Fabric is all about is, ab is, um, is about the, the possibility to have very large graph structures. Uh, not, we're not talking about a million nodes or a million, a million relationship. We're talking about a trillion nodes or a trillion relationships, you know, lots of zeros, right? Uh, something that cannot fit on one machine. Right, uh, and and you have very big machines these days. <laughs> I, d I guess you know that. But if you have a workload that does not fit on one machine, then you're going to have to decide where to cut a graph. Right, that's called that's a that's something we call sharding. Right, to how do you shard a graph? Right, and no one knows about this, but it's it's been a research topic and an academic topic for the past decades to try and come up with a way to sensibly cut up a graph because you understand that if I cut it up that means that the connections between one part of the graph and another part of the graph all of a sudden they become interrupted right how do you do that and that's that might affect certain queries that might affect certain results that might affect performance that might affect all kinds of different things so what we're doing with fabric is we're coming up with a solution to that sharding problem which allows you to create these are the, are the pizzas there philip yeah so i'm i'm finishing this and then we'll We'll uh, we'll have have uh, some food, but in Neo Neo J 4.0, you can actually create these really complicated um, sets of graphs that are on all kinds of different machines, but that uh, can be queried as if they are one graph, right? So, um, and the only reason why we do that, or why we are able to do that, is because we are going to rely on your domain expertise. We're going to ask you where do you want to cut the graph <laughs> right because sometimes there is a sensible way of doing that you know per country or per continent or per per language or per uh, uh, time frame you there's sensible ways of cutting up uh, specific domain models um, but you have to do it based on 
you know, the, the what's right for that domain, right? So we're going to ask you how to do that. We're going to ask the user, how do you want to model this? How do you want to cut this up? And then you're going to uh, manage this as if it's one graph, but it's going to be physically distributed uh, over X number of machines, right? And it's going to behave as one graph. You query it as one graph, right? Which, I mean, for most people, they're not going to care about this. <laughs> Most people can easily fit their data set on a Raspberry Pi, right? Uh, no. <laughs> no, no, for most people. But there are people where it's very important. I mean, uh, and, and for example, we do, I'll give you an example of um, one of our client big clients in Benelux is uh, Signify, the, the Philips Lighting. Right, that's an Internet of Things use case. It's connected lamps. When you have connected lamps that generate data, you're not going to be able to fit it on a Raspberry Pi anymore. You can't fit it on a server anymore. You can't fit it in a data center anymore. It just creates so much data that you will have to cut it up. Right, but for most cases, I mean, Sportpalais, beautiful company, beautiful data set, but we're talking millions of nodes. We're not even talking billions of entities. You see what I'm saying? Most people will not have that problem, but some people do. And, and that's why, and for, for, for Signify, for example, for Philips Lighting, it is very relevant to ask them, how do you want to cut it up? And in their case, it's per customer, right? Because customers manage real estate, customers have buildings, Customers have meeting rooms, customers own lamps, and you cut it up by customer, right? Uh, so that's the way you, you do that. But it's a really interesting domain. It's been a, a, a topic of uh, research and development for literally as long as I've been with Neo4j, <laughs> and we're finally coming out with software that uh, that's going to address it. I suggest we don't let the pizza cool down uh, because they're they're going to go down in quality. So why don't we have a piece of pizza and we can do like ten more minutes afterwards, and then uh, Manu, you can take over if after that. And uh, together with Anthony, is that okay? Yeah, let's have a piece of pizza. Thanks, guys. <laughs>